All right, so what is translanguaging? Translanguaging is basically focused on seeing being bilingual or multilingual as a resource. So it's this idea that someone, um, first of all, that even people who more or less identify as monolingual from even from a linguistics perspective as having only one language, um, aren't really only monolingual, right? They have multiple different ways in which they utilize language um, and discourses for the different audiences that they need to interact with at different times. Um, Translanguaging is the idea that you see these multiple languages, multiple cultural experiences with different audiences at different levels, doing different things as ultimately and always um, something that is good, something that you have that's good. It's an asset. Um, and it means that sort of the more that you've learned to deal through reading, writing, communicating in more than one language and utilizing those multiple forms of communication, you're really, really good at negotiating meaning, making meaning with others, um, and working with others. And this is actually ultimately good for academic practice. So that's kind of the overall idea of translanguaging. Um, a couple of key figures. So Suresh Kanagaraja is one um, he is, I think he's at Pitt now, I want to say. Um, but he's been, he's originally from Sri Lanka. Um, he is in the field of applied linguistics. So basically he has done a lot of work teaching um, typically what we call ESL or ELL learners sort of writing and reading in academia throughout his career. Um, and he's written of translanguaging, which is a relatively new term in the past, I wanna say 10 years. Um, but I have some highlighted sections here. You don't have to read the whole thing now. Um, but basically the idea that as people who are users of language, but also as teachers, we wanna focus on how people move between their languages, right? Um, instead of sort of getting a sense of, well, there's L1 and there's L2. And since you are doing, that stands for language one and language two, and since you are doing your schooling in L2, language two, we want to see a full, discrete, complete, fluent, um, however we deem that uh, representation of that language. He says, instead of looking at that, we wanna look at how people move between them, how they utilize their knowledge of different languages. Um, and these languages are intermeshing all of the time. Um, he also talks about wanting to see process, the process of composing in multiple languages. So one thing that he's done and suggests that teachers do is look at how you write for different audiences in different languages and start to get a sense of focusing on the function of what you're trying to achieve, because that can then help to move away from a deficit error focus more towards a communicative um, meaning making focus. In particular, so he talks a lot about mobility, right? We, we are, again, working with multiple languages. Context is really key. So that audience, what you're trying to do. Um, but I think his especially important point is to see that multilingual writers are, are agentic. They have agency in their writing. Um, what they're doing, sort of working between and among these different languages is very sophisticated. Um, and can be something even if, for example, it produces something that might be seen as a surface error, um, what that can in fact do is deepen our understanding of a concept as well as push on the boundary, boundaries a little bit um, of what people see as being so-called good writing, which is actually a good thing. Another key scholar is Ming Zhang Lu. Um, and she definitely talks about it from a teaching perspective, mostly. Um, but this idea that as teachers, we need to kind of get rid of this idea that um, in order to do well um, academically, where you're working largely in one language, right, in this case, English, that you have to be able to utilize English in the same kinds of ways as the dominant expectations of what English should look like. She says that's problematic first because there isn't any such thing as standard English, right? It doesn't really exist out there in the world. And we know that because we have all of these different, um, uh, so you were talking about Chenu, the, these very different comments you can receive from people about your writing and what seems wrong or, or fine. Um, 
that's definitely a sign that standard English doesn't exist out there in the world as something that we can achieve. Instead, it's something that we're building together over time. So if we can sort of get rid of that and look instead at focusing on um, academic communication being something where we're, we're working to make meaning with each other, that's really important. One of her key ideas um, in particular, and it comes up in a different essay um, that she writes, but the idea is that, so we know that academics um, spend a lot of time working really hard reading through certain ac other academics work, right? They take the time to say, okay, instead of me saying, I don't understand this, I'm going to assume that because this person is published and has a degree, um, that they know what they're talking about. So I'm going to work towards understanding them. Um, but she argues that we don't do the same thing for students, but that we should, right? So the idea again is that um, to work from a perspective of translanguaging is to work between languages to make meaning together and to have enough respect for students to say, I'm going to assume that you're making a sophisticated argument and I'm going to work with you to understand what you mean. Some interesting projects that are starting now that I think are really good um, early resources um, one project that's going on, I think largely in the writing studies area, but I think it's multidisciplinary, is this anti-racist scholarly reviewing practices. Um, so it's a Google Doc that's being put together um, and basically what they're trying to help sort of people to understand is how to change the way they respond to perceived issues in language, perceived um, issues in understanding um, as they're reviewing. So this is actually a really great document where they talk about different ways to approach um, someone's writing as a reviewer, uh, but also as an author. So I can show you this more closely here in a minute. <clears throat> Another really important recent project that's happened um, was with the, the college composition and communication folks. Um, they put together, uh, this ain't another statement, this is a demand for black linguistic justice. Um, so while this may not seem to you as something that's directly related, basically it's calling for, we need to stop saying that somebody needs to achieve only standard English, whatever that happens to mean. Instead, we need to allow people and celebrate people writing in sort of multiple world Englishes and dialects. Um, these, I, and I, I can show this to you as well. So I'm sharing these in particular. And actually, let me just go straight to them. In large part because these are things that you can share with fellow teachers in your department, that you can share um, with fellow students or workers in the department, and certainly with people, supervisors who are reading your work. Um, both of these statements, in part because they are sort of being released by people who um, are part of major institutions who are working with students in education in particular, but also because they're straightforward about ways to think about how to change how we approach writing and what is good writing um, in general, right, so across different fields. Um, yeah, both of these, I think, are coming out of writing studies, but they're meant more broadly. So these, I think, um, and they're listed actually in the recommended reading section that I've included. Um, I think these can be really, really helpful. Um, one of the many ways to sort of begin to self-advocate for yourself as someone who is a sophisticated writer, who brings sophisticated ideas. Um, ideas, cultures, et cetera, to your programs and to your writing. Um, being able to share these things is one way that you can advocate for yourself. Okay, so these are there. And then, like I said, if you go back to this and you scroll down, I've got a couple of quotations here that we looked at briefly. And then I've got some recommended readings and at the bottom you can see direct links to those two things there. Okay, so I think that those are really helpful. All right, so what I'd like for you to do, and actually only take 10 minutes to do this, I'm gonna put you back in a breakout room. You can look at the questions and stuff that you raised earlier. 
and think about in terms of the questions and concerns and comments and things that you were talking about earlier, think about how translanguaging, um, we've talked about it very briefly, but translanguaging might be a really good way to reframe some of these issues that you're having or worries that you're having or comments that you're receiving. Um, some other questions here that I have. So um, basically what I just said, it says, how do these, what do these mean for your own writing? But basically how, how can looking at these documents and thinking about translanguaging as a concept help you to reframe your own thinking about your writing and your, and your process as a, a scholarly writer and a scholarly student? Um, one thing is how could you use these things to advocate for yourself? So if you can think directly about, let's say someone mentioned their PI and working with them, is, it, is, is that a relationship where you can bring this in and say, hey, there's some ideas that are sort of developing here that are really important. Um, this is actually a conversation that's been going on for at least 15 years. If we look at the work of Kana Garaja, maybe there's some things that we should think about in terms of how we write this, right? And then finally, what are some limitations, right? What, where can you not stand up for yourself and, and what should you do about that in those situations? So I'm gonna put you in a breakout room talk for 10 minutes and then we'll come back and sort of talk through some strategies together, okay? All right. I apparently can't put breakout rooms together without stopping share. <laughs> There's too many things going on on the screen. Okay, there we go. Okay, I know that was quick, welcome back. Um, all right, so I'm actually going to go back to what you had shared earlier from your earlier discussion. Okay, um, so I've had you talk a little bit about translanguaging. Um, if anybody kind of wants to share sort of thinking back on your first discussion, um, how you think what you've learned briefly about translanguaging today might help you to reframe or reflect back on some of these things you were talking about earlier today. And certainly if you have a question for me, I, I'm happy to come up with some ideas as well, some strategies. I think like one of the widely agreed point was that this could be like a great resource or I don't know, like, um, and like probably like a lot of these people are doing a great job, a great cause of, you know, kind of in, in, like trying to be inclusive in this landscape of like English writing composition and stuff like that. And which should be, I don't know, like rewarding in the end. But at the same time, it was kind of like also like widely sure that if um, like if you're not in the some kind of authority, authoritative position at this point then like you know if you're the one who's being if you're not an interview interviewer but interviewee like it's not you you're not in a position to, to kind of dictate like kind of these kind of changes at the moment at least so yeah there there's I think concern about that but well I mean like if you're an educator at any point so probably you might be want to kind of start some grassroots movements or something like that so. Right. Yeah, so I will say, um, as far as the uh, response to reviewers, um, that started, uh, uh, that's a lot of um, graduate students and early career researchers. Um, so it is possible. However, you're right. It does depend on the field and what people think about that and what position you're in. Um, so I think actually one thing that I was thinking about as you were discussing was getting harsh comments from journal reviewers, but this can be from supervisors, et cetera, right? How do you respond to these and how can you sort of balance um, thinking about what is potentially an issue with communication, right? Because it is possible that occasionally the way we write, whether we're multilingual or not, right? Whether we're trying to write in another language is just because of the communication isn't coming across, right? Mistranslation, but sometimes it's less actually an issue with communication and more 
and a lot of my experience with reading work across the board, um, more preference, right? So people have preferences for what they would like to see. So there's a couple things um, that you can do with that. So with harsh comments from reviewers um, and supervisors. Um, so reviewers first, because there's a little bit of a different process you can go through with them. Um, so I don't know if you know this or anyone has told you this, but you can actually respond to negative reviews. You can come back and say, no, I do not agree with this review. So if you go through the review and you say, actually, they don't seem to be understanding the science we did, or there's nothing wrong with our statistics, our science, our, our methods. What they seem to be responding to are preferences in language or, or citations. You can actually write back to the journal to ask for another reviewer to point out like, okay, they've said X, but in fact, that doesn't align with these other people who know about this specific subfield, okay? Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. For reviewers, you can in fact write back. Um, depending on the field you're in, obviously a lot of times you'll have to get your, um, your PI or your supervisor to do that with you. Um, it is also possible in that case to bring on someone else you might now. So if you know someone who's a little further on in their PhD or who's in their early career or just a little bit further along than you, who's willing to, to hold your back, seek them out and ask them if they're willing to do that. Um, so that's one element of things you can do. And in fact, um, my partner and his PI recently had to do this for a journal where the person clearly didn't really understand what their subfield was and was responding stuff, but they were like, but that doesn't have anything to do with our study. Whether or not the journal accepts that has been up to them, right? But you do have that power. When it comes to your supervisors, um, so if you have most, so one thing, uh, getting contradictory comments. So that's gonna happen, right? You're, especially when you're working on the dissertation, you're having multiple different supervisors read that, you're gonna get different comments. So you kind of have to make a hierarchy of those comments. The first person who matters most is actually you, right? So which of those comments, whether it has to do with language and communication or anything else, um, do you think actually is an issue with communication or do you think is something that in fact that you want to hold on to and you can make that decision. Obviously, the second most important person is your direct supervisor. Okay, and you'll have to kind of play that a little bit carefully, depending on your relationship with that person. Right. Um, but sometimes you can say like, well, I understand. Thank you for your comment on X here is what I was trying to say and why I think maybe we could do something in between, right? They may say no, right? But at least starting to say things like that where you're saying, thank you, your commentary is very helpful. Here is what I think maybe I was trying to say can start to lead to a discussion, which can be helpful, okay? Um, the other thing about other reviewer or other supervisors on your committee, you don't have to take all of their comments. You just don't. Right. And ideally, your, your first supervisor, the chair of your dissertation or your, your direct PI will understand that you don't have to take every single comment. Right. So some of that is a little bit about sort of saying, OK, maybe there are some small things that might be grammar related that I'm OK with just having them change. But there might be larger things that are more me, sort of related to me as a scholar that I want to say thank you for your feedback but here's what I was trying to stay and say instead. And usually if you start it with, thank you for your feedback about these things, people are a little more willing to say, oh, you know what, you're right. You are a developing scholar. I'll consider this other perspective. Um, so that is one way to deal with that. Um, another way to deal with that, I think, so Chenu, you were talking about going to the writing center. Um, the writing center is a good way to get feedback, at least from the perspective of, okay, is it really an issue with communication? Like, are they not understanding what I mean? Or is it a preference? And then how do I start to find language to say, instead of saying, this is a preference, I'm not gonna change, right? Do that thing I was just talking about. Thank you for your feedback on X, but here's what I meant, right? Um, which I think actually can be really, really helpful. Okay, um, so that is a good point. Um, the other thing is, is 
start networking with your fellow students to, to just agree to stand up with each other, set up networks of people again who are a little bit further along than you and you feel like they will have your back, okay? And hey, you can always email me and connect me to your supervisor directly. I'm happy to talk to them kindly about what we found in my field when it comes to effective communication. Um, so that's a really, really good point though. And it's true, sometimes you just have to let sleeping dogs lie for the purposes of getting something finished, right? But eventually, um, if you keep pushing and keep believing like I, I am doing something meaningful with my work, whether it's someone's preference or not, um, you will start to be able to get some of those differences out there. Um, in terms of editing and concision, so, and difference in writing styles. Actually, one thing that I was thinking about as I was looking at those um, was, so something that came up for two of you is that writing in Spanish, um, you've been writing in Spanish and academic Spanish. And so writing really directly in um, being straight to the point in genetics feels difficult. And I think one question that's good to, to sort of ask yourself is, why does it feel so uncomfortable to be so straight to the point, right? Maybe it's that in the academic writing that you're used to working with, that makes it feel like you're belittling your reader, right? To be straight to the point, right? Like that, maybe that's part of it, right? Um, so then the function, right, of how you do maybe academic writing in Spanish might be more about I'm going to take you on a journey of how I did my research and allow you to decide for yourself whether my conclusions are correct. And then you have to say, okay, so here's this side here. Academic writing in English seems to say, especially American English, I want you, because I have no time to read this, I want you to say in three very quick sentences, X, Y, and Z is my point behind this. It's uncomfortable. You may feel like you're belittling them, but imagining a different audience there um, I think can be helpful, right? So maybe if you imagine someone who's like got 5,000 papers on their desk and is really, really busy and just needs to in 30 seconds or 45 seconds, get a sense of what your whole thing is about. And that's all they care about. They're not judging you on <laughs> anything other than that. Maybe that helps a little bit, right? Um, the other thing I was going to say is to go back to Kana Garaja. So he talks about comparing your writing and communication with different audiences. It can potentially be helpful to say, all right, I'm actually gonna look back at my academic writing in Spanish and get a sense of what was I trying to achieve with my grammar, with my language, with my style and my organization. And then compare that to what I'm seeing in English academic writing and how can I kind of hold in my mind these two different audiences and approaches? Um, basically, it's a matter of getting a look at, okay, it's just a different context. You can write to that person in that context. You have the ability. It's more a matter of figuring out how to sort of hold those two things together at the same time, right? Um, and figuring out, okay, who is that audience and how can I adjust what I'm used to doing to meet them, but maybe also push them a little bit towards my communicative approach. Um, one short thing about, and I know we're running over time, so I just wanted to say this quickly for concision. Um, and this is probably the only grammatical advice I will give you this whole, <laughs> this whole time. Um, for concision, particularly in science writing, um, it can be really helpful, but I think this is across academic writing, actually. It can be helpful to think about how spoken English works um, because a lot of uh, American academic writing tends to focus on that. Um, so English is what's called an SVO language, subject, verb, object. So every active sentence in English and most people when they're speaking will have a sentence that starts with a clear subject doing something, right? So if you sort of go back to your writing and think, all right, I have this longer sentence. How can I narrow it down? Who is doing what to whom or what? And try to make it fit that sort of more spoken English um, approach. And this is in fact something I tell native English speakers as well, right? Anyone who's trying to have that more direct, concise academic writing, thinking a little bit more about how 
written English works and finding the subject, verb, and object and trying to put them closer together without a lot in between is actually a really helpful way to be concise on top of that. Um, so yeah, that's my only grammar thing I'm actually going to give you today, but um, it's been helpful for me actually as a writer as well to be more straightforward. Um, finally, one thing I'll say, because again, we're running low on time. Um, so what is good writing, I think, is a really great question and writing for a broader audience. So one thing I suggested briefly early on, but that I think is also really, really helpful as you're continuing to develop is to talk to your supervisors and your PIs about how they write, right? And sort of push them on it a little bit. How long did it take you? Did you do revisions? Did you do it the night before? What were you thinking of? What were you trying to achieve here? Um, and the more you talk to them about that, the more they'll actually have some, some pretty interesting insight into how they're writing and how they learned that. And that can actually help you to start to get a sense of, oh, here's how they arrived at why this is their preference for this particular type of writing. And here's how I can start to look to their writing to try and achieve that as well. So talking to them about how they write is actually really helpful. And then in terms of the broader audience, I find it really helpful not just to talk to um, your supervisors about how they try to, let's say, take something they wrote about for an academic journal and teach it to an undergrad class, basically, um, but also looking at things like popular science. So, you know, how does Scientific American talk about genetics? How do they do that? Typically, it's my understanding that um, the scientists will write something for them and then their staff writer rewrites it, <laughs> right, to, for a broader audience. But looking at those kinds of things and getting a sense of how are these popular science writers breaking down really complicated ideas for audiences who aren't familiar with the jargon? Um, Often you'll find, at least from what I can see, is that a lot of those cases are using um, writing that's more similar to spoken English, right? Um, and taking the time to define um, jargon when they're going to use it, right? Um, and then uh, I was actually thinking of philosophy for you, Chenu. Um, also looking at some scholars who push against. So Bell Hooks is actually this really great scholar who does theorizing work. Um, and she has always taken the stance that she's going to write for a broad audience. Um, so she's someone who is, I think, really interesting to look at to get some of that information. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to officially stop the, the workshop, but um, I'll stay here another 10 minutes to see what other questions or concerns you have.